Um, welcome, we are a body like Bruce and today we are presenting you with another book that Bruce Lee read in regards to health and nutrition. This book is titled Let's Get Well by Adele Davis, a practical guide to renewed health and nutrition. We have that book here. It was part of our it's part of our collection. Uh, we happened to pick it up somewhere, a second hand shop or wherever, before we even realised that Bruce Lee read this book and her other titles. On the inside dust jacket it states about the author Adele Davis is considered one of America's most highly regarded nutritionists and her early books have been highly praised by leading experts in the field as well as by doctors and by patients who have benefited from her counsel. Now Miss Davis has completed a book of even greater significance and practical value, A Nutritional Guide to Aid in Recovery from Illness. In this guide, in this remarkable book, she tells the millions who suffer from illness in which a lack of nutrients is a contributing cause how proper diet can help restore health. In simple non-technical terms backed by medical references in her day, Miss Davis reviewed the scientific literature indicating that recuperation can be hastened by the proper selection of natural foods and the use of supplements. Here are some recommended nutritional principles to aid recovery from such diseases as heart attacks, ulcers, diabetes, arthritis, gout and anemia. Miss Davis also explains the function of nutrition in disease related to the blood system, the digestive system, the liver, the gallbladder, the kidneys, the nervous system, the muscles, the skin and burns, accidents, surgery and sexual problems. Interestingly, interesting case histories illustrate her points. The book includes a comprehensive index and tables of food composition. We may have found this book in a suitcase on the side of the road because it looks like the name and the cover here can't really see it. It's by the same person who dumped a whole lot of 1970s, the really old, old small Jehovah Witness booklets that we picked up. That's probably where we got it from. Let's Get Well by Del Davis, dedicated to the hundreds of wonderful doctors whose research made this book possible. Forward by Joseph C. Rusa, MD. Miss Adele Davis could add and let's keep well to this her latest book for the processes that you get well should also keep you well. The knowledge of how to keep well is most important for the layman and the professional man alike. There are three necessary rules to be observed in keeping well. One, self-discipline, without which the other two rules are of little value. Two, proper use of the body. And three, adequate nourishment for the body. These three rules of good living are considered so commonplace as well as so fundamental that each individual thinks he has the prerogative to handle these problems by himself without advice. Even the professional man assumes too often that the patient knows how to obey these rules. This book, Let's Get Well, is devoted to the third rule of good living, or how adequately to nourish the body. As we have acquired more information on this complex subject of nutrition and metabolism, it has created a great interest among the layman and even among some professional men. Unfortunately, the professional man is so busy diagnosing the diseases of his patients and giving the necessary medical and surgical treatment that he has little time to study the newer ideas that have developed recently in the field of nutrition. The professional man is a specialist in pathologies. He knows how to recognise the different diseases, but often pays too little attention 
to the standards and requisites of good health. If more attention were paid to the problem of keeping people well by following these necessary rules, we would have less of a problem in taking care of people who, who succumb too readily to the degenerative diseases. Miss Davis has compiled an excellent reference book. Her statements on how to get well and keep well are documented so well that any person may check these references for further information. It is true that many of these references are clinical observations only and need more laboratory tests on deficiencies to furnish further proof of their correctness. However, one cannot ignore repeated good clinical results from the adequate use of good nutrition as these facts come to light, and it behooves all of us to be curious about the statements and to accept them as we see the good results. And, and she talks more on that. That was July 2nd, 1965, Pasadena, California, USA. Here's the contents page. Even more. Let's get well. Chapter 1, let's get well. There are so many of them, the people who do not feel well. The statistics of illness in the United States are too depressing to examine for long, 40 million at the time, with allergies, 17 million with ulcers, 10 million with arthritis, and so many millions whose jagged nerves have driven them to using tranquilizers, or whose exhaustion has prompted the taking of pet pills, their addictions to barbiturates and amphetamines have mounted into the hundreds of thousands. Statistics of the most rapidly increasing illnesses, heart disease, diabetes, cancer and strokes changed too quickly to be accurate. Dr. Ansel Keys, at the time, of the University of Minnesota, USA, is quoted as saying, or was quoted as saying, that no one longer asks who has heart disease, but merely how severe is your heart disease. Is there a happily married woman free from the anxiety that a coronary attack will force her into years of unbearable loneliness? An adult who does not live in dread that cancer will strike himself or his family. The number of ill persons so appropriately called morbid statistics is morbid indeed. Each figure represents the heartache and suffering of a wonderful human being, longing for his birthright, health. This book would have been too depressing to write were it not that nutritional research, like a modern star of Bethlehem, brings hope that sickness need not be a part of life. Nutritional research is being carried out at an unprecedented rate in almost every medical school, university and pharmaceutical laboratory throughout the world. About 6,000 original scientific studies in nutrition are published annually, 7,149 in 1960 alone, and summarised in nutrition abstracts and reviews. Thus the knowledge of how to build health through nutrition, which is the subject of this book, becomes greater each year. Such research has but one ultimate purpose, to alleviate the suffering of mankind. Until the findings of these investigators are known and applied, this goal cannot be reached, and the energies of numerous brilliant scientists are largely wasted. There is much still to be learned, but that is no argument against applying what is known. And she goes deep into the research that was being done in that time period, the 1960s, etc., Okay, we're going to skip a lot of this. Um, okay, she receives a lot of letters. She received a lot of letters on thousands of wonder, wonderful letters from wonderful people, each wanting to know how nutrition might help overcome some abnormality. Because there was not enough hours in the day to read so many letters, let alone answer them properly, she tried to give the information the writers requested in this book. She states here, because we are capable of magnificent positive emotions, positive emotions, she particularly disliked the statement, we are what we eat. A continuous awareness, <clears throat> a continuous awareness that we are very much more than what we eat, she believed is necessary to promote health. Within each of us is an immeasurable capacity for love, understanding, compassion, creativity, joy, and all positive qualities. The tragedy of illness is that it prevents the full expression of outgoing healthy emotions and creative abilities. Instead, it focuses abnormal attention inward upon oneself, causing one to retreat into a body 
that may become a prison with dungeons and torture chambers. She felt that the achievement of health was worth considerable effort and expense because it can add happiness to our lives and to others, it can help us to know love and warmth, song, laughter and music, to experience the joy of creativity and satisfaction of accomplishments well done and to have wide interest in this age where exciting advances are being made in every field of human endeavour. Okay, chapter 2, meeting the demands of stress. To meet the nutritional demands of stress must be the first consideration in planning any diet regardless of whom it is for and in coping with any disease regardless of its nature. If the body's reaction to stress is understood and the diet can be adjusted accordingly, the problem of achieving health is often largely solved. This subject, therefore, is dealt with here and in most of the following chapters. chapters. What is stress? Any condition that harms the body or damages, breaks down or causes the death of a few or many cells is defined as stress. If the diet is adequate, repair quickly occurs, but when rebuilding fails to keep pace with destruction, illness is produced. Disease results from multiple stresses, such as anxiety, overworked, overwork, perhaps bacterial or viral attack, and inadequate diet, sleep and exercise. Here's one. Um, Dr. Arnold Errett. We thought we put that book inside. We must have left it outside. And he quotes, um, all disease is constipation. That's what he <coughs> came to realise Excuse me. years ago. Uh, okay, here it is. Uh, what's it called? The mucilessless diet healing system. We're going to look at that later on. Because as you notice, it coughed a lot. It's because there's probably too much mucus in the system, according to his book. Okay, um, we did undertake it before, but we didn't read it properly, and we tried to do um, six weeks or something of eating just green vegetables and all this sort of stuff, whatever he suggested, and we went mental and had to have some chicken, right? Yeah, and when we found out that was a method for the people in a sanitarium that he was visiting right that was the method he used to heal those people yeah, um, further on here it's got the body's reaction to stress <clears throat> nutritional needs are increased experimental adrenal exhaustion in humans variations in nutritional requirements nutritional needs are increased etc okay And the next chapter is Drugs Increase Nutritional Requirements. A friend recently remarked, of course, I know your attitude towards drugs. Does she? I thought, fairly convinced that she did not know that I would take an aspirin for a headache as quickly as anyone else. Pain is often a greater stress than a drug. Although our own medicine chest is a mother hubbard's cupboard, drugs have saved millions of lives. The Dr. Davis, the author, felt that there are too many being used. Hospital patients receive an average of seven different drugs and some are given as many as 35. Self-medication, the refilling of prescriptions without a doctor's advice and the demand for prescriptions against a physician's better judgment are certainly unwise. Aspirin poisoning causes a number of accidental deaths annually and children allergic to this drug are often harmed even by tiny amounts given for a mild cold or fever. Okay. Scars can be prevented. Those cholesterol problems. Low fat and low cholesterol diets. When low fat diets have been given to patients with atherosclerosis, appetites have usually become ravenous. Excessive calories, mostly from starches and sugars, have been consumed and quickly changed to saturated body fat, causing the blood fat and cholesterol to soar. The size of fat and cholesterol particles has also become much larger. The amount of cholesterol changed to bile acids has greatly reduced, and coronary patients adhering to such a diet have become markedly worse. The American Medical Association in that era had warned physicians not to recommend such diets, but they are still being used. 
Diets low in cholesterol have also achieved exactly the opposite from what was hoped. Such diets throw the liver into a frenzy of cholesterol-producing cholesterol -producing activity, causing the amount in the blood to increase, and so forth. Heart attacks, America's most lethal disease, and so forth. Arthritis can often be relieved. Diabetes is not always permanent. Learn to live without an ulcer. It's just two unvarying rules. Problems in involving the gallbladder. Diseases of the digestive tract. There's quite a lot of information here. And we're going to go to this chapter we try to keep this video short right don't want to flood your mind with too much information planning your nutrition program the more seriously ill the person the poorer his appetite hence the more important it is for food to taste delicious and to be attractively served fortunately research has shown that any health building food can be eaten during most sickness and that special diets which ignore the increased needs of stress in the patient's individual individuality are often 40 years behind scientific findings I uh, remember reading somewhere quite a while back years back that cats animals etc refrain from eating food when they're sick and maybe that's a suggestion but here it says no no you should eat it's like you're feeding that um, illness right? to get over it sometimes there small frequent meals because malnutrition of years standing upon often precedes the onset of any illness digestion and absorption are usually below par and putrefactive bacteria thrive in the intestine sickness causes the digestion to become even more faulty simultaneously the need for body requirement skyrockets and nutrients are often lost through you know when you're sick different symptoms right Vomiting, diarrhea, excessive fluid intake, and or the use of diuretics. It's probably like caffeine, coffee, right? Um, the more ill the person, the more frequently food should be served, and the smaller the meal should be. Yet the greater are nutritional requirements. Yet the greater are nutritional requirements. This situation is like having an overdrawn bank account when current bills are soaring. Deposits must be large enough to cover both past overdrafts and present needs. Temporary acids to digestion such as enzymes, hydrochlorific acid and lecithin may be used. Yogurt and add syphilis milk or culture can change the intestinal flora as supplements which will require no digesting should be heavily relied upon. Supplements. Ideally every nutrient should be furnished by foods alone and when no food is refined and all are grown on excellent soils, supplements are not needed. The Hunzas who have been repeatedly investigated over the past 40 years, or the Hunzas, I don't know where that is. Probably in the um, Middle East or Europe or something. Yeah, probably in Europe or something. Who have repeatedly investigate, been repeatedly investigated over the past 40 years. It's prior to 1960, right? Have lived on such a diet and remained free from all diseases. The personal study on the Hunzas, H-U-N-Z-A-S. See if that was actually true in that era. Supplements kept in bottles are too often forgotten, hence she recommends, Adele Davis, that they be served from a divided plastic box or similar container sufficiently attractive to remain on the table. One friend keeps hers in a covered ceramic bowl which she calls the Davis cup. Because excessive fluids can wash water soluble nutrients through the kidneys, supplements should be taken with milk during meals rather than later with water. Okay, yeah we have a lot of supplements lying around, I haven't used them for a while, they're either going to be used up or thrown out okay um yeah that's a good idea it's a hell of a good idea okay she so recommends milk take it with milk rather than water later with water if you have problems swallowing capsules or tablets you can use potassium chloride as a salt obtain all other minerals in powder form get iodine from granular kelp or lugol solution and take drops prepared for babies of vitamin A alone and of vitamin A and D. Vitamin E capsules can be chewed or pierced with a needle and the contents squeezed into the mouth. 
B vitamin syrups are available, powdered vitamin C in the B vitamins, may be added to milk or juices, or made into a solution. And so forth. Okay, where's the plan? Foods to emphasize. During illness, the limited stomach space should be used for foods with the most to offer. Emphasis should be placed on the following. She recommends eggs, two to four daily or more, used instead of most meat. Boil, poach or fry, or scramble gently at moderate temperature with a small amount of oil. Serve with custards, egg nogs, soufflés, fondues, omelettes, fruits, toast, etc. etc. Well, do your own personal research on that because it may be mucus forming or something like that. You know? Um, look into the re uh, your personal research on it. Do your personal research on it. Don't forget this book is like 1960s. Yeah, read right about that. Um, milk obtain at least one quart daily, including one cup of more of yogurt or insipulous, preferably homemade. Yeah, preferably homemade. Cows or goat's milk. Well, that's quite expensive. Yeah? Goat's milk. And a big container, like thirty-seven dollars, but maybe it's worth it. It's not really that. It's probably about the size of this book, right? Uh, can. I don't know, probably about, yeah, just a 500 gram can or, can or something like that, 1.5, 37 bucks here. Um, now she's saying have liver, brewer's yeast, brewer's and tortoli yeast are excellent, full fat soy flour, cheeses. Yeah, these are all like mucusy, very mucusy forming, okay? As stated in here, it probably lists uh, all of these things in here, right? It's been mucus forming and all that sort of stuff. But that, this guy's book, uh, Dr. Arnold Eric, his was written over a hundred something years ago, way before this book, right? Okay. She's got some recipes here. She's suggesting lecithin, by granular lecithin instead of the liquid which is mostly oil, keep refrigerated. Iodized salt, use exclusively. If few vegetables and fruits are eaten and a dependable source of iodine is available, the salt may be mixed with equal amount of a potassium chloride salt substitute. Supplies, sodium chloride and a small amount of iodine. Salads, fortified milk, this gives you some ingredient, uh, some recipes here. Suggestions for breakfast, sliced orange or other citrus fruits or fresh and strained juice or other fruit or juice, preferably fresh omelette, boiled poached, scrambled eggs or fried, pound, quarter pound liver, kidneys, etc, etc, morning midday meal, cup of pepper, or whole or skim milk, lunch eggs and liver, cheese, meat, and so forth, afternoon mid meal, she looks like she's breaking them down into six meals, okay, at bedtime, warm milk or a warm milk drink supplements, and supplements again. With each meal, 100 or more units of vitamin E, tablets supplying balanced B vitamins, a full amount of yeast, liver, and lecithin are not taken. With each meal and mid meal during acute illness, a single tablet or separate one supplying the anti stress formula of 500 milligrams of vitamin C, 100 milligrams of pantothenic acid, calcium pantothenate, and other B vitamins, and so forth and so forth. Adjust the program to meet your individual needs. Yeah, we suggest this. By glancing through the chapters, if you get hold of this book, Let's Get Well by Adele Davis. Adjust the program to meet your individual needs by glancing through the chapters in which your problem is discussed and emphasise the nutrients found to be the most important in reporting your health. And so forth. Above all else, check and double check to see that all body requirements are supplied. It's according, yeah. In relation to these vitamins, being careful not to get nexus of some while omitting others. To overlook a single nutrient is like trying to play Chopin with a piano key stuck. Do not expect to rebuild in a few weeks what has taken years to tear down. Occasionally, off days and upsets are to be expected, regardless of the food eaten. Patience and persistence are important. Are important. Fortress Against Disease. Yeah. What's she trying to say here? Yeah. 
the refined food industry by giving untold millions also controls a vast amount of nutritional research. Much of it is valuable indeed, but information that might harm sales goes unreported, and problems whose solution could do could decrease profits remain investigated. Yes, there's, there's some things that they're not telling you, right? They're leaving out, basically. People attempting to alert the public are subjected to vicious smear and smear campaigns, referred to as alarmists, and their books are widely publicised as not recommended. The late Rachel Carson, author of Silent Spring, was thus shamefully attacked, her compassion for humanity damned as being unscientific. Invariably, the propaganda article stated in that time that America was the best fed nation in the world, or is, that our life expectancy is increasing and that our diet is better than it was a generation ago, always implying that everyone enjoys maximum well-being. Americans are the most abundantly fed, but their diet is far from the best nutritionally. Because fewer people die during childhood, millions are reached the later years, reaching the later years, but the life expectancy of a 40-year-old American is near the lowest in the world, and so forth. Prior to that, I guess they were like you know, really healthy because they ate from the wild, grew their own food, all that sort of stuff. We had adventuring, you know, that was the exercise, chop wood to build log cabins, all that sort of stuff. So they're pretty healthy, right? But these days, because it's all done for you, you know, you just sit back, eat the Kentucky Fried Chicken, suck on the sodas, you know, eat a bag of chips, two bags of chips, and watch pointless TV, and then put on the pounds. Everybody's expecting everything to be done for them. Wave a magic wand, all that sort of stuff. Yeah, um, yeah, pretty good book. Okay, yeah, nice book, very good book. What's this? Two unvarying rules. What is this one about? Ah, she's probably suggesting all the um, vitamins you should take, etc., etc. So, if you like this video, you like the idea of this video, that Bruce Lee read this book and you want to get hold of it and read it, you probably find it free online, PDF format or something like that, or at a second hand shop, bookshop if they're still around. Not many around these days, it's all online, right? You might find something like something like this, or her books at um, gutenberg.org, uh, archive.org, or internet way machine, way back machine. Um, just go and have a look Google it and you'll probably find a free PDF of it we wear some PDFs they're like two pages of it they say the full book and you've got two pages of it or it's set out you know someone set it out and it's all all over the place ok so if you like this video and want more like you might want us to read the video on Dr. Arnold Eretz, Mucus to Start Healing System. Okay, we're going to look at that again. Okay, because we, we believe that. Um, yeah, because we've got runny nose and coughing and all that sort of stuff. It's probably too much mucus. Another one is, um, what's his name? Dr. Sabi. Okay, you can have a look at that as well. It's basically um, reflecting. It's pretty similar to Eretz's book. Okay. Uh, here's a book here Food Faking Exposed it's quite old but what we're going to do next is this is a book we believe that Bruce Lee read we read it before we thought what a weird book right but we're going to do the video on that next ok so don't forget to subscribe to us to our channel give us a like add your comments below the video and then go share this video on this book, Let's Get Well by Adele Davis, one of the many books of hers that Bruce Lee read.